we go. Welcome back to Impact Show. I'm so excited to have Jesse Katz here. I can't believe you're like right here. Oh my gosh, be here. You're, you're, you're like this iconic individual. So many of the wine industry and other industries love your work. And I'm so excited to share with the IMA and our global membership. We are here in Newport Beach right now at my friend Craig Atkins' beautiful home. And I'm so excited to talk to Jesse a little bit about the impact he's making, not just on his industry, but how he's a leader in inspiring so many people of thinking differently. If you think about wine, food and beverage, hospitality, those industries have been staples and they haven't really changed. It's always about distribution, it's about internet, it's about sort of the traditional things. You just get into a configured paradigm. What Jesse's done with Aperture and this wine brand is truly something inside out to where he's not using traditional lines of distribution. He's not using traditional ways of marketing. And it's sort of a relationship driven business that's been born around your, your vision. And so our audience knows a little bit about you, but I think it would be really cool, Jesse, is to kind of maybe speak for a minute or two about your background. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much for having me. Sure. It's an honor to be here. Of Always a wonderful excuse to get out to uh, this beautiful part of California. Um, but yeah, I'm not uh, your typical winemaker. I'm the first winemaker in my family, and I was introduced to wine through my father and through my family's travels. My father is a photographer, and I actually grew up in Boulder, Colorado, your, not your wine mecca of the United States. Right. Um, and really through his travel and through his work is how I got introduced to wine. And um, he started doing books on wine when I was in my early teens. And although we were living in Boulder, Colorado, we were traveling to Tuscany and Burgundy and Bordeaux. And he's now done 17 books, 12 of them on wine. Wow. And as a kid from my early teens on, I was traveling and living in all these different areas. And you're living in the old world, in France, in Bordeaux, wherever it may be. They pour you a little glass of wine and introduce it to you as part of the food and part of the culture of the region. Right. So truly, from a very young age, I've been, I've been drinking wines. Um, and I was always fascinated with it. I knew from a very young age how I was fascinated with the concept of how distinct a certain place could have an effect on the final wine. Right. That kind of essence of what I would call now it was terroir, uh, I didn't know how to articulate it at the time, but that was really, really interesting to me at a very early age. Um, so when I left Colorado when I was 18, I moved to California having no idea really what I wanted to do. I was fascinated with wine, but didn't think that was a career path that I had the opportunity to do. So I went to business school out in Santa Barbara. I needed a summer job. I found the closest winery to me and got a job at Fest Parker Winery when I was 18 years old, and that was my very first harvest. Um, at that point, I saw that there was actually a career path for a young professional that wasn't born into this industry, because in the old world, it seemed like it had to be within your bloodline, uh, passed down generation to generation. And um, so I tr after I got my degree in business, I transferred to Fresno State, which is, mm -hmm. if you get a chance to go visit Fresno, I would suggest not to. Uh, we have none of this beauty here, uh, but truly one of the great winemaking schools on the planet. There was right. kids from Italy and France and Greece and uh, Argentina who would all come out to California and that part uh, to go to Fresno for this school. There was a winery on campus, so I got my uh, hands and feet dirty uh, making wines while going to school and getting my theoretical background uh, understanding in the classroom. And that's when I fell in love with Bordeaux varietals. And from, you know, I really feel really fortunate because from the age of 18 on, I knew I wanted to be a winemaker, so at a very young age. And, um, that understanding of Bordeaux varietals is I knew I, I also needed some experience. So I spent a, my first early part of my career spending half the year in the Southern Hemisphere mm -hmm. for their harvest and then coming back to Napa uh, for our harvest. So I'd get th uh, two harvests in each vintage and got to work with some of the great wineries and winemakers on the planet. From um, uh, My first harvest was in Patagonia, Argentina, working for the Sasakaya and Argiano families right. of Italy mm -hmm. um, at this small project in uh, Patagonia called Bodega Neomia. And then I came back to California working for Bob Foley, went back out to Argentina, worked for Paul Hobbs at his winery out there, Vina Cobos. Uh, and then I went to study in Bordeaux at Chateau right. Petrus to right. focus on uh, the varietals Merlot. So always kind of wanted to pinpoint Bordeaux varietals, um, but specific areas for certain uh, varietals. And California was so dominant in Cabernet, that was kind of my home base for that. Right. Um, and I went on to make wines for other folks. And then while I was at Screaming Eagle uh, in Napa is when I actually started Aperture back in 2009. 
And uh, during this time period, as we started to see these vintages get warmer and warmer, and sometimes the season's getting shorter and shorter, uh, I wanted to find sites that had some spectacular sites, soils, right. but slightly cooler. Sure. And so that's what brought me over to Sonoma. And also the barrier of entry for a young professional sure. like myself right. um, is about a half to a third of the price of the price, uh, if you're looking at per ton or per acre, sure. of Napa Valley at right. the time. It's, it's, it's now kind of a, evened out a little bit more, but still Napa has a premium on it. So starting my own brand, went over to um, Sonoma right. in Alex the hills of Alexander Valley, because mm -hmm. some of the best soils, best aspects, best sites, and slightly cooler nights. And that's kind of how I started my own brand. And Napa obviously is such a dominant force in Cabernet, and it's truly one of the great regions for Cabernet in the world. Um, but I've been able to come over to my little region uh, in uh, Alexander Valley, and we have the highest rated wines ever made from the region. Right. Uh, highest rated Malbecs in the history of California, sure. and the last two years have been right. the highest rated in the world. And last year, for the first time with this kind of proof of concept, um, Robert Parker, kind of the biggest uh, critic in my world, right. uh, had one of our Cabernets as, as tied for the highest rated Cabernet in the world. That's awesome. Yeah. And continued success there. I mean, something we share in common is I started my company as a teenager, and I think a lot of people really didn't take me seriously. And I, believe it or not, catered to clients <laughs> that didn't take me seriously, uh, which turned into a pretty good career. So how did you break into such a, sort of like a, a dominant older school industry as a teenager and what was some of the sort of roadblocks that you faced how did you get through them because we have thousands of people watching this right now that some of them are young some of them are teenagers with a great entrepreneurial mind but they're just daunted by this traditional market that they're in and, and older school mentality that that gives them fear to go in how, what advice do you have and how did you do it? And no industry has that more so than the wine industry. Yeah. Uh, like for, I'll give you a quick example. My very first winemaker dinner that I'd ever been the head winemaker of, right. I was 25 years old, uh, shortly after I had just uh, taken over this position. And right as I was getting up to speak to the group, uh, the waiter grabs me and asks me for my ID. Right. <laughs> so, uh, you awesome. know, the, and so early on, it was like, what the heck's this kid doing right. uh, here? What does he really know about it? But to me, instead of letting that be a disadvantage, I really right. wanted to use that as a talking point. Sure. And some of the reasons why I was there, some of the people that I had been able to surround myself with. Uh, and then shortly after my career had started seeing some of uh, the product that I was sure. putting out, right. then, uh, you know, I kind of based it off of the merits of, of what we were right. doing. Right. And always didn't, I wasn't trying to be the next uh, Petrus or Screaming Eagle or something. Right, we right. had a very different mentality of what our brand was going sure, to be right. um, and really wanted to kind of have that um, direct to consumer model. Right, right. And uh, because so much, you know, the, sure. the di di distribution model, the three tier system is so controlled by the big dogs. Oh, absolutely. And with as we've seen more and more mergers and acquisitions sure, sure, in the space, sure. it's even gotten more and more difficult. Right, right. Uh, so we really kind of created the demand of the winery, the demand of the brand, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. started really small, um, and then decided to build right, right. a unique experience for guests to come to a state of the art winery once we had our name and following behind it. Before we get into distribution versus direct marketing which is a big topic that I'm looking forward to hitting on yeah Let, let's just talk a little bit about another thing we have in common the Guinness book of records okay we got the largest virtual marketing conference award and we're officially awesome which is cool congratulations you sold some ridiculous bottle of wine tell us about how you earned that Guinness world record and, and how you were able to sell a bottle of wine for, for that kind of money can you can you tell our audience a little bit about that story sure um, so I've also throughout my career part of the marketing and getting my name outside of just the normal wine sure. bubble because yeah. there's the wine bubble the wine geeks certainly sure. kind of uh, have followed my career for at least a short period of time uh, but to broaden it out to get outside of the, the people who read wine spectator or that um, who still love wines, right. we started really kind of pairing with different athletes, celebrities, um, charities to really right. make an impact for the sure. charity, but also right. get some great press from it. Yep. And so we uh, partnered with this great guy, Shep Gordon. If you don't know Shep, yeah. there's a great <laughs> movie called Superman. Right, right. The guy behind the scenes of everything. He was the manager of uh, Alice Cooper, sure. Janis Joplin, nice. Jimi Hendrix, and he really created the identity of celebrity chefs. Um, and it was for Emerald Gossi Foundation, Carnival de Vin out in New Orleans, one of the great, great events in the wine world, right. wine and food sure, world. Right. And uh, there was a couple bidders there who really wanted this special bottle that right, I made for right. Shep. And there was sure. like two, or there's two left. One was auctioned at the, um, uh, that evening. And, you know, we expected some, we knew there was some money in there and uh, sure. we expected some uh, good returns on it. 
but it ended up going selling for three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. My goodness! And setting the Guinness Book of World Records for most expensive bottle. You of would wine think ever there's sold. like an NFT on it or something. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. And, and three hundred fifty thousand dollars. One all bottle of it wine. went to the charity. Which all was went to better. the charity. I mean, what a wonderful feat, and what a great way we use the Guinness World record as a way to introduce our brand as well. So it's great for marketing and we have great relationships there at the IMA. So tell us a little bit about how you were to truly disrupt an industry that has been so traditional. And when we talk about distribution channels, you know, anything to do with alcohol, spirits, wine, I mean, it's all by those big names that we know, which yeah. we won't name, but there's only like two really, but three. But you know, you kind of did what Netflix did, right? Like, let's go direct to consumer. Let's not necessarily go the traditional route because the consumer feels empowered having the control of buying, knowing the price point, getting onto a subscription. Tell us a little bit about how you were able to do that, but more importantly, how you were able to make it work and sustain that because so many people have tried that and haven't succeeded with that direct model. Sure. Well, I think one of the key things is being kind of a young uh, person in the industry, we also kind of broke down some of those barriers of like, uh, being afraid to ask about wines. Right. I think a lot of the youth and the early next generation uh, is a little bit intimidated by wine sometimes because especially if you look at some of the old world packages, you don't even know what varietal it is. Sure. And so I tried to break down all those barriers. We're making a luxury product, don't get me wrong, but be able to ask those questions and have an understanding and bring people behind the scenes and bring in athletes who might sure. not know anything about wine right. and have them ask the dumb questions. Right. So, uh, and then show those on whatever platform we're showing it on. So you can kind of like, oh, I didn't realize Von Miller didn't know that that was that right, and right. have that relation with that. Um, so that was one way. And then to your point with distribution, we still utilize distribution to get sure. in cer certain restaurants. Right. But I think people realize that now they can order wines directly to their doorstep just exactly. as they order their Amazon packages. Sure. Right. Um, and we created a model that we, there's certain wines that you will never see in distribution. So right. the only way you can get those wines is if you're part of our mailing list. Right. You're on that mailing list. There's, it's not like a wine club, so you're not guaranteed uh, wines and it's right. not forced down your throat by any right. means, right. but we send out offerings. And if you love that wine and you want more of it, you can go. Sometimes they sell out immediately. Awesome. Sometimes we'll have wines, hopefully uh, year round, sure. and kind of have slowly built this list right. and created the, when you get that offering, sure you better buy now because right. some of these wines might not be there right. and kept on kind of creating that uh, scarcity uh, in, in the wine space. And still to this date, 80% of our revenue comes from our direct consumer model. That's awesome. And one of the things about Aperture and your brand is I feel more like a member working with you. I feel like I'm punched into a club versus a consumer, like a customer. How are you able to bury that psychology? Because I think the real successful brands and you don't have to be a credit union or a bank or a community bank. If you treat your member like a member instead of a customer, it seems like that repeat business is always gonna be there. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Well, we started this brand as a partnership with my father and I, as a family project. Sure. And so when creating this identity, we wanted our first members, our first members were literally family members and friends because right. we'd call them out, hey, I've had this wine to sell. Right. We can only drink a barrel of it. We have two extra barrels. Uh, are you guys interested? And then obviously we've kind of continued to grow the brand, but we had the same mentality of our consumers, whether they're family members, friends, or, or new friends. Right. And so we've always had a dialogue with them about, you know, uh, let me grab one of these yeah. labels real quick. So all the labels, um, that we utilize are my father's. Sure. Uh, this label was the very first one we've always this is used. Photography, right? This is his okay, photography. Right. And so anytime we have a new label or anytime um, uh, there's something coming out, we have a little bit from my father, who's a very uh, right. amazing personality himself, and we'll have a little interview with him or we'll have a little story. Sure. So right, right, they right. have a feeling, whether right. I've met them or not, whether sure. they've been to the winery or not, that they have an understanding of the father-son relationship, right, right. a parent-child relationship. Wonderful. So there's yeah. a lot of, and a lot of our story is also based around travel. And so there's a lot of relatable par parts of the story. And every one of our customers has some sort of dialogue back and forth with us. And also customer service. Like our, we have an amazing team that if um, it's your, 10th anniversary, we can figure out a way to do something sure, special for you, sure. handwritten card. And so all those different kind of things we try to uh, put into our brand. And I love the way that you bring your father into your creation, you know, from the photography to the books that he's written, to that storytelling, to your beautiful new facility up in Sonoma County, which I want to get to. Uh, much like your father's created a huge influence on you, so has mine. He's not here anymore, but every story that I can integrate with his legacy 
creates so much more culture to the work that I do. Completely. And people are very, very much interested in that. So going back to the label, and I absolutely love some of the uh, photography pieces here. Now, are these all different on each bottle or is it based on year and vintage? Can you talk a little bit about that? Good question. So each SKU is, as soon as we figure out that photo for that label, always sits with that SKU. Always so sits each with that vintage SKU. of our Bordeaux blend that you're holding in your hand will have that photo. Okay. And it takes my father, because he's so particular about the artwork on sure. the exterior, right. I'm so particular about the wines inside. Right. Uh, we create the wine first, and then we come up with a photo, uh, sometimes having a direct relationship sure. with that. That was with barrels that were made for, specifically right. for right. us. Sometimes having more of a fanciful part, part of the story. Absolutely. And do each photo have like a story behind it? So Absolutely. obviously, of right? Of course, of and, course. Okay, so I'm curious, Dad, did you shoot this on 35 millimeter film or is it digital? Are these some of these vintage photos or are they pretty current? Just curious. Depends on the stage of my father's career. Okay. He was all film up until 2006. Okay. And then in 2006, he partnered with Sony cameras. Right. And he's one of Sony's, he was actually Sony's first, what they call artisans of imagery. Right. And so now from 06 on, he's been all digital. Awesome. Um, so anything pre-06, sure. so right. most of the labels have been more recent, so they're more digital. So let's talk, I mean, we're all about branding, marketing, communications at the Internet Marketing Association. Sure. Now you've got literally thousands of wines, right? And you could go for like Charles Shaw, $3 at Trader Joe's, Screaming Eagle. I mean, literally, like a lot of people will say like a, a suit, right? Like, okay, that suit, yeah, I could get you that same suit for $100 that you just spent $8,000 for. <laughs> so can you talk a little bit about how marketing plays into the value of wine? Because you know the process. A lot of people don't know the process of fermenting, barreling, you know, crushing, all that. But is there that much of a delta on the price points? Because I feel like I get a good value with an Aperture investment, but there are some wines where I feel like I'm overpaying and some wines where I feel like, how is Charles Shaw really charging $3? I mean, they still have a bottle, they still have juice in here. So like, how, how does the pricing matrix work? So it's, it's a big question, because yeah. if you're looking at the Charles Schwab model or something, they're buying whatever grapes they can find, whatever lots they can find, filtering it, adding a lot of different things. Right. So there's a lot of manipulation to get it to taste Sure. somewhat appropriate right uh to your point my bo <laughs> bottle and packaging cost me more than three dollars a bottle right uh so <laughs> and also so. they're going quite inexpensive on uh all the glass sure. and it's such a mass it's a it's right. a volume play right. once you get into the kind of luxury tier um some is scarcity so if you think of like screaming eagle right. there is a small small plot of land it's a, only about 50 acres okay. and what gets made uh, from that okay. it's a global brand sure. and there's supply demand theory uh and it's uh this plot of land is one of the great pieces of terroir in Napa Valley. So consistently year in and year out, that will produce one of the great Cabernets from there. Right. Not saying it's the greatest, not right. saying it will, there's others that can't rival sure, it. Sure. Um, and some have to do with also scores right. um, and how, you know, the influential uh, critics in my world from Robert Parker or Wine Spectator, Wine Enthusiast, whomever it may be, can really kind of have an influence on that. And um, the winemaking, once you get to the luxury tier, mm -hmm. I think you really just have to look at kind of what their production is. Right. The larger and larger production, you know, you have to uh, manipulate certain elements right. of that. Right. If you're getting to the luxury tier, um, you know, we're able to make a wine, uh, you know, our, our entry level Cabernet is $70. Okay. Um, that was mm -hmm. uh, on the same list right. uh, from that vintage sure. as Screaming Eagle. It was right. within one point of that. That's amazing. Um, but we're able to buy fruit and buy land out in Sonoma for a half to a third of the price of Napa right. Valley. So right. there is some inherent cost in certain areas. Right. And so Napa Valley inevitably is going to be more expensive sure. if it's made at the same quality than a Sonoma property. So it's also kind of knowing where you're picking and choosing from. But, you know, Napa has such a history and such a marketing behind it. Napa Valley has been marketing as a luxury tier market right. for 25 years right. more than right. Sonoma. One of the things that Jesse hit on, scarcity. So think about your product, your service, whatever it may be, and think about the scarcity of it and then price your value. It could be in public relations, it could be in wine, it could be in whatever your product is. If there's a scarcity, look at Bitcoin, right? There's a scarcity of Bitcoin and that drives up value. Think about how you can apply that toward your business and I think that's an invaluable thing. Now let's talk a little bit about this beautiful facility that you built. It's absolutely astounding. Tell me about your architect's vision behind this, how you met the architect, because I haven't seen a winery that the juxtaposition, the feng shui, how you brought it all together in clean lines contemporary. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. 
So when I was interviewing architects, I interviewed over 10 architects, from Howard Backen, who built Screaming Eagle while I was there, um, and, and many others. The, it, the guy that I ended up going with was a guy by the name of Juan Carlos Fernandez. Mm -hmm. And Juan Carlos is originally from Mexico City right. and started a firm in Napa about 20 years ago. Young firm, but what they've done is absolutely spectacular. And they've built some of the most stunning wineries I've ever seen. Cade up in Howe Mountain, Nine Sons, uh, Fleet Mel uh, Melko's new winery. Right. Uh, and they've never done one in Sonoma. Right. And so oh, wow. um, the other unique thing with them is each winery had such a unique identity to the brand, the owner, whatever it may be. Unlike some of these other architects that had the identity of the architect, this really kind of took pieces of each part of the brand and made it part of the architectural design. Right. So I wanted to do something very unique. Right. Um, I wanted it very modern. I wanted pieces and elements of the brand sure. Aperture right. to be showcased within the architecture right. as well. Mm -hmm. Aperture, for those who don't know, is the pieces of the lens and the camera, all the shutters that open and close. Depending on how uh, wide or, sh yeah. or closed the aperture is, is what's in focus and how much light's being let in. When you're enjoying the wines and you come to our hospitality space, and I don't call it a tasting room because it's more than a sure. tasting room, it's an right. ex experience. Right. Tasting room can be a bar and a square. Right. Uh, this is a full experience. Every seat in the house has vineyard views. Right. We put the hospitality space in the center uh, of the vineyard at the very top of the property and lifted it 36 inches. So nice. if you're sitting there during the summer, it right. feels like you're floating above the vines. Beautiful. And the architecture of the building was, is actually they took pieces of the shutter, the aperture, and made it three dimensional. Oh, that's awesome. And so we have all these different private rooms when the aperture is closed, but it's actually been Sure. able to work within these regulations that we've had That's to work awesome. with uh, because we have all these private rooms that can do intimate Amazing. experiences. Yes. When the aperture opens, all the glass that you've seen the oh, photos of so cool. opens up, all the walls fold in and it can turn into one indoor outdoor right. experience. If we wanted to do a wine dinner, a big large event, whatever it may be, it's a very workable building and really wanted to use it as an incubator for a lot of different crazy ideas I have. Because I think Aperture, eventually I want to get it to be that brand that kind of intersects art and wine yep. and art in multiple different facets. Absolutely. Not just photography, music, culinary, yeah. uh, multiple different forms of right. art. So right. uh, that's- And I love it. the homage back to your father again, Aperture as part of the camera in the wine and now in your facility. I think your architect absolutely nailed it. Yeah. There are a few wineries that really stick out. Obviously, Di Rouge. There's nothing that looks like Di Rouge, who is also a great friend. Um, we were both inducted in the Ellis Island Medal of, of Honor Society in New York. And, um, you know, the storytelling there, Yours kind of reminds me of that. It's it's really not, it doesn't blend in. And it's it's new age, it's contemporary, it's clean, but you've got that aperture, you have that integration, you have technology, very unique, you gotta go check it out. So as we start to conclude this interview, Jesse, you know, a lot of our audience are entrepreneurs, just like you, just like me. And so many times they face adversity and you know, you're kind of in a good place now. You've got some you know, momentum, you've got succession, you've got sustainability, you have all the things that come really tough in business. When you had your toughest times, your darkest hours, those moments where you just felt like, I just don't wanna even deal with this. How did you like push through that? And, and what advice do you have for people watching? Good question. So the wine industry is difficult in a few different realms. Uh, the biggest issue, and you've I'm sure heard of it, how do you make a million dollars in the wine industry? You start with five million. Um, <laughs> it's because it's a cash flow issue. And right. if you don't, if you're not born into wealth or sure. into the wine industry, um, the wines that I'll make this year, 2020, most of the reds we won't release till 2023, if not later. Right. Uh, so you're kind of always building inventory. And I got to this point where uh, I was terrified because I had a huge demand for the wines, but I didn't have enough money to kind of really sure. make what I wanted right. to. I was still working for other wineries, uh, using my salary to kind of support the next vintage. Um, and so I got to a point where I'm like, all right, and I've been a part of a few different acquisitions. Uh, Stan Kroenke sure. uh, had purchased Screaming right. Eagle, yep. Yep. Bill Foley, who's the Fidelity right. title right. insurance, who also owns the uh, uh, hockey team out in Las Vegas, the Knights, uh, purchased Lancaster while I was making the wines. So I'd seen a lot of these acquisitions and uh, been a part of those teams during mm -hmm. those. And so I really wanted to, I think it was in 2015 when I went off completely on my own, right. didn't have a salary anymore, took as much debt as I possibly sure. could right. to fully dive in. Right. And you know, I, I, I was quite young at the time um, and was a little bit terrified of sure. kind of not right. seeing any return on those money. And of if course. let's say we had an off vintage or whatever it sure. may happen. Um, and so really dove in. And But I think that was the time that I hired my first employee, Lauren Wong, who's just been uh, influential. She's now a partner in the brand. Um, 
And I think that was the pivotal time that I t went from being an employee to being a true entrepreneur. That's because awesome. before I always had a little sure. bit of a safety net. Right. And this gave me the opportunity to purely focus. And as any entrepreneur out there knows, if, you, if it's your livelihood on stake, you're going to be more passionate about it. You're going to put everything into it. And it's been the best decision of my life. Epic. Yeah. So um, Northern California, kind of like Barcelona. Um, in Spain and in Sonoma County, Napa. I feel like those regions for some reason make the greatest olive oil, makes the greatest wine, and the food just tastes delicious. Is it really something in the soil? Is it something in the sunlight? Like what's going on that everyone's all hanging out up there and they can't replicate that in other regions? What's going on? It's the terroir of the area. We have such amazing soils up there, such amazing sunlight. Right. I, I've worked with a lot of chefs all over the world and all over the country. And one of my very dear friends, who's the great chef in Arizona, um, uh, Bo Mack, he's one of the most talented chefs out there and he came out to Sonoma and did an event with us and he's walking through and he's been trying to put gardens in Arizona and all these places and he's walking through and he picks up a strawberry that's growing out of the sidewalk and has a bite of it and he goes right. this is the best damn strawberry I've ever had <laughs> and you guys are growing it out of your sidewalk nice. I've been trying to grow strawberries right. in Arizona for five years so a lot of that is picking and choosing where we are. Right, right. Um, you know, you look at these famous wine regions. Right, right, Usually, right, the right. food is very well paired with the right, wines, right, right. and uh, a lot of that has to do with what you can grow as far as the varietal goes. Usually, sure. goes well with what you can grow as far as the food standpoint. That is so so true. Um, you know, really, really thankful for your time today and sharing your insights with our audience. Our good friend Joe Stapleton, who connected us. Um, it's stories like yours, Jesse, that make it so worth the work that we do because by exposing you, it really motivates thousands of people watching and inspires them to make their dreams a reality. For all of you that want access to Jesse or want to visit Aperture, down below you've got our contact information. We'll put you in touch with Aperture. I've tried the wine. It's absolutely, it's so good that there's these little goosebumps back here that just kind of come up. I mean, it's really good. And um, going to really good, the Wine Spectator also says that. So Wine Spectator is kind of like the US News and World Report for your industry. How, how does that sort of work where you just get assigned a ranking or a rating, right? Because you want to go for that 100 point. Can you tell me a little bit about the dynamics of that sort of methodology? Certainly, um, and each publication is different. Wine Spectator, obviously one of the big heavy hitters in my industry. And early on, when no one knew who the heck I was, I was sending in wines blindly, hoping that it would show up in a tasting amongst 800 or so other wines, right. and that that wine would show itself. And thankfully, a few of them did. Right. And that's kind of how one of my names got associated with, and also being associated with some amazing brands earlier on, really kind of tied me into some of the great people in, in that industry. And it is a very small industry sure. as well. Um, so now we have a little bit better dialogue with them um, and each critic. So uh, right. they still taste them all blind. Uh, so they don't know which wines, but at least they kind of know the story behind Aperture, know right. some of the intention sure. behind it. So when they reveal, oh, this is Aperture, like, ah, oh, got it. And they can take their notes and tell a little bit yes. about the story behind right, it. Right, well. right, right, right. Um, and being, uh, having quite a unique story than most people in the wine world, uh, I've been very fortunate that they've uh, supported us in many ways yes. and highlighted a lot of our uniqueness. And think about those rankings. I mean, the rankings that they've gotten are top in their industry. Think about your industry. Every industry has some sort of report or some sort of ranking on a product, a service, a consultant, a wine, whatever it may be. It's really important to set a rank for yourself. And maybe you don't finish at the top, but you know who's on the top and you know where you need to be in order to really be relevant for yourself and your industry. And so these are the kind of things that really make the Internet Marketing Association. It's people like you. And it's those sort of stories that really we get to share and, and get people motivated on. And from what I hear, you do have some friends that are celebrities. Now tell us about how you help them. Do, I mean, do some people create their own bottled wine based on their brand? Can I just open a winery in my backyard? If I have a backyard <laughs> like this, maybe I just, can you tell us about that we could dynamic? Put something nice here, actually. Maybe uh, a celebrity or two that you work with and like how that works if I wanted to start my own winery. Just curious, because I know you consult as well. Sure, I consult for about seven other brands from wine brands mm -hmm. to uh, hotel groups like the right. Montage yeah. Hotel Group. Yeah. 
um, that just built a brand new, yeah. uh, gorgeous spot up in Healdsburg about 10 minutes from yeah, the winery. Chris Hamaway, who's on our board, who's the head of marketing Absolutely. for Montage International. Beautiful new property. Tell us about when, that. When, when you come up to uh, Aperture in Healdsburg, Sonoma County, there is one of the world-class resorts in in the planet. Certainly, I think it is the new, set the new bar uh, for luxury resorts and wine country about 10 minutes from the winery. And it's in this little, up in the hills, you feel like you're in this little forest. We planted vineyards throughout the entire property, um, but you're 10 minutes from downtown Healdsburg. Absolutely. It's, it's absolutely world class. Um, but what, what the, actually the first uh, celebrity partnership sure. that I had uh, was while I was still kind of on the break of whether I should go off on my own or not. Right. And still, you know, I was in a very comfortable job. I could have stayed there for my entire career and been fine. Um, and um, one of my very good friends, uh, families, uh, the Beale family, oh, yeah. um, Jessica Beale was getting married to Justin Timberlake. Oh, there you go. <laughs> and, uh, and they wanted to, they reached out and said, would you be willing to serve, uh, sure. we wanted to serve your wine at our wedding. Right. So I had an idea to do a special bottling just for them uh, to honor that special moment in that day. Nice. And so they and Justin and Jess, I've drank uh, many bottles with, and they're really amazing, have amazing palates, right. and love the craft of wine. Right. And so we started putting blends together, and we made one barrel specifically just for them. Nice. Did a custom label uh, called Blue Ocean Floor, which oh, uh, was cool. on Justin Timberlake's uh, 2020 Experience album, was the last song on oh, it, so uh, cool. written about Jessica. Wonderful. And we did one barrel of it, 300 bottles, and it was all for the wedding uh, and for family yeah. members and all that kind of stuff. And that was my first celebrity label. Right. Uh, and it was really just a friend thing. We sure. didn't really talk about right, it. Right. And all of a sudden, you know, we're getting on People Magazine and all these things. Epic. And I saw kind of how those different partnerships can really. Uh, align yourself with unique marketing sure. uh, and get my name outside of the normal wine bubble that right, it was. Right. I started to uh, have that following with. Right, right. And so then we started to get creative of not only can we partner with celebrities, but how can we also partner with charities to right. do get double whammy, have, right. have some sure. great promotion for their charity, yeah. raise a lot of money for them, and have a, a celebrity who's passionate about that charity and Definitely. I can help be the middleman there. Oh, yeah. So we've partnered up with Von Miller, Tony Hawk, nice. Ellen DeGeneres, Excellent. the Lakers organization, nice all doing one to two barrels, so sure. pretty small off uh, wines, and specifically tied into a charity as well. Right, right, and right. so that's, uh, in the last five years, we've raised over $1.4 million for charities. 100% uh, of the proceeds going to these individual charities. And I'll end with that. Two things Jesse just hit on, and we've talked about this before. Latch on to other brands, latch on to celebrities, people that you know in your network, either personally or a company or a brand, which is almost like a celebrity too. If you do work with them, if you partner with them, that's gonna help lift you and expose you, vice versa. And philanthropy. Jesse, ever since I met you, you've always had community first. You've always talked about philanthropy and charity, and I think that's so important. There's so many people in the world that need help, either education, uh, foster care, whatever it may be, and by aligning with nonprofits, you lift up together. It's a win-win always. So with that, I thank you, our audience, and I present to you, Jesse Katz, thank you so much for your humility, for changing the world, and for sharing your story with the Internet Marketing Association. Now let's go drink some wine. Cheers. Thanks for having me. Rock on, dude. That was great. Okay. Fantastic. This has been a Santa Shots podcast.